here's Inken to introduce himself. All right. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Engin Kairaklolu. I'm a member of the Chapel team for over more than five years, I think, right now. But I've been in a member of Chapel community since 2012. Um, so I've been a long time lurker, then slowly got myself into the community interactions, and now I'm a member of the Chapel team. And one of the main tasks that I have is to lead the GPU efforts in the team. And today we are here to talk all about GPUs. And I, I know that some of you already have some experience on um, GPUs with Chapel. Uh, some of you may not. So today's uh, introduction will be hopefully uh, relatively gentle. So I'll just start with a recap of Chapel arrays um, that without touching any GPUs, how to declare them, etc., and then introduce basic GPU concepts talk about GPU versus CPU portability, use some math functions, do some GPU-based reductions, and finally finish up with um, some data movement between GPU and CPU. And I will stop at that point. Hopefully we will have another demo session like this soon where I can go more into uh, more advanced features of using GPUs in Chapel, using multiple GPUs within the same node and scaling up to multiple nodes with multiple GPUs. But those topics will not be covered today, although I'd be happy to answer any questions um, after the demo if you have if you have any specific questions. Um, and my setup here uh, is on the left-hand side, you will see my code, and I'm hoping that someone will speak up if the font size is too small, if they cannot read it or anything like that. I will give two, three seconds. And quiet means I think the font size is good. I'm seeing a thumbs up in Teams. Um, thanks for that. And on the right-hand side, I'll be just running code. And what I have is, oops, um, is uh, Chapel version 2.2, which is the la latest uh, Chapel release that came out, I think, a month ago ish. And on this system, I also have CUDA 12.4 installed. And I haven't tried this before the demo, but what I have is an RTX A2000, which is a relatively typical workstation GPU. Um, um, that's not necessarily an HPC level GPU, but it's still a relatively common and powerful one. With that intro out of the way, uh, let's start with the first uh, step of the of the way, which is a um, recap of Chapel arrays. So what I have for that is, and this will be the structure, hopefully that I will stick to throughout my demo, uh, is for each of these steps, I have a bunch of sub steps that I will just fill in the code for, and write the code live. So um, Hopefully it will not it won't be excruciating for you to watch me type code, but I also have my uh, cheat sheet on the back, so I can just go back and fix things if I make any mistakes. All right. So with that, I will start with a very simple example. As I said before, in this one, I will first declare an array, write it out on the console, and increment all the elements by one and print it out. So let's get started. So what I do here is an array declaration. And specifically what I'm declaring here is an array uh, of integers. And these are typically um, uh, or uh, normally 64-bit integers in Chapel. And this array has indices 1 to 10. So in Chapel, you don't have to have zero-based arrays. It can be anything based. It could be 5 to 10, the indices for this array, for example. But just because it's common and it's familiar, I'll just declare it 1 to 10. And then I'm going to write it out. And at this point, let's get this code to compile. So on the right hand side, I'm now compiling the code. And once it's compiled, we can run it. And you will see the output. So now I'm seeing 10 zeros. So Arrays by default are initialized to uh, the default value of the type and default value of the type integer is zero. So unlike C, uh, you are getting all zeros here. If it was C, you would just get uh, random numbers. So with that, now let's do an array element incrementation by one. So a typical way of doing that in Chapel is through for all loops. And a for all loop looks like this. So What's happening here is I'm iterating over the array R and getting an element, um, getting each element into the variable A and incrementing each uh, variable, um, each element rather, by one and then printing out the array again. 
So there are some uh, um, there are some key observations here, or the key points. Uh, the first of which is Chapel also has a for loop, and it has a for all loop as well. So the difference between the two is for loop will be sequential. It won't use multiple tasking. It won't use any hardware parallelism, and for all is the exact opposite of the spectrum, uh, where there will be multiple uh, cores working on this and potentially hardware parallelism down um, uh, under the hood as well. So the code has compiled and if you uh, run it now, we are seeing once and that's the that's coming from the second right LM. So what would be really interesting? Uh, another interesting thing here in Chapel is you don't have to use arrays in an element wise fashion. So what you can also do is you can increment an array as a you know, as a wholesale, a wholesale statement, and it will have the same effect. So this code will also have the same effect as the first one, in the sense that it will iterate over all the elements of the array, incrementing them by one, and under the hood, it will try to use all the parallelism that it can get. So functionally, and what's happening as, and in terms of what's happening under the hood, is the exact same thing, but just more concise and intuitive way of doing it in Chapel. And what we do, what I will not cover today is another power of Chapel is that you can have distributed arrays and you can do simple statements like this on distributed arrays, which will execute in a distributed fashion as well. But that's not uh, in the scope of today's um, conversation. So with that, that's all I got for um, a recap on Chapel arrays without touching any GPUs. I'll pause for uh, five seconds to have questions. Uh, I see a hand. Um, Michelle, can you help yeah. me moderate the questions? Absolutely. That was my hand. So mm -hmm. my question is, can you access arrays like A of I or something like that? Or, or are a, you know, with indexing, like you often do in other programming languages? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course you can. And the way to do that would be, okay, let's start simple. Let me comment this out. So what I can do to index an array is as simple as this. And while that compiles, you can also iterate over an array's domain. And you can imagine a code like this, for example. So let me explain what's going on here. So in Chapel, we have arrays, as I declared here, but we also have this first class concept of a domain. So the domain of an array is basically the index set on which the array is defined. So here the index set of the array is 1.10. So R that domain is actually a concept that represents this 1.10 idea. So and you can run loops like for all loops on top of domains as I am doing right here. And what will happen in effect is instead of yielding elements from the array, it will just yield indices from the domain. So this will just yield 1 to 10 in a parallel fashion, and you can just use that I to access indices of the uh, of the array. Uh, and I did something silly, so I'm just going to set this to three. We are not seeing the impact on the right hand side because I just set two to two again, so we are not seeing the difference, but, um, but it changed just believe me. Um, so this next run will just um, see a better uh, output. Yeah, that's a good question. One thing well, that that's compiling. Uh, Hui has a question. There's a couple of questions in chat, okay. so I'm going to read them off to you. So sure. Hui is asking, um, can you do math on an array like multiplication division? Absolutely. Uh, let me show you that. So I can, I'm assuming that that's like a wholesale uh, multiplication division kind of a question. So I can just multiply an array like this um, or um, let's make it like multiply it by eight and then maybe divide by four, printing it out at each step. So both of these operations will be also uh, parallel and potentially distributed if your array is distributed. That's a good question. And right, can, so it's just doing it per element, right? It will be doing it per element, yes, exactly. Okay, and then Oliver is asking, um, is there a difference between iterating over r.domain versus one dot dot r dot size? Good question. So the question is whether this or um, this has a difference. Well, in this case, no. 
in this case, they are the exact same thing, but there's certain like code maintainability questions with this, right? Like one advantage of this is I can just go back and change this array to be a zero based array. Right, because maybe that makes more sense for me and maybe that makes more sense for my application. Now this first for all that I wrote is still a perfectly fine for all, but this is not. So now I like this version of this for all is less maintainable than the first one. Another case for this is, um, and again, I, I'm talking about distributed arrays right now, but like if I had var r as a distributed array, then this for all loop will be a distributed for all loop that will be aligned with the arrays distribution so that you know you can efficiently process the distributed array. But this for all loop will not be a distributed one because you are just iterating over some random range from one to uh, r that size and it has no distribution information. So this would just run on the main locale that uh, that is running the execution and it will be inefficient. That's a good question. All right, we have another one. Uh, from Hui, if I have two arrays, can we do math on them? It will be element based or matrix. Oh, and will it be element based or matrix based? Yeah, that's so a good question. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm guessing like if you had two arrays like A and B, could you say A times B and then what would it do? Yes, that's a good question. So um, let me declare another array that is similar to my R. But I, and non creatively, I'm just going to name it Burr. So now I have two arrays, and let's make Burr all twos. And let's print them. Okay, let's print an empty space first. Let's print R and Burr. And then let's print R times Burr. So. <clears throat> The question is yes, you can, and operations like this will be turned by the compiler into a for all loop that iterates over two arrays in an in a uh, lockstep fashion. So it will be an element wise operation, and it will not be a matrix operation, even if R and Burr are two dimensional arrays, two dimensional arrays, let's say. So it won't be a matrix multiplication, but it will be an element wise multiplication of two matrices or two two dimensional to the two two-dimensional arrays. So as you can see here, you are seeing R, you are seeing Burr, and the result is just a multiplication of the two element-wise. Good question. Anything else? Not right now, so I think you can go on. All right, uh, just give me one second, please. All right, sorry about that. I'm going on. Um, let me go back to our outline. So we covered some um, chapel array concepts and they were really nice questions. Thanks for all of those. And now let's get to GPUs. And for that one, I have another outline that is pretty similar to what we covered already. So I'll be just copy pasting some code from the previous example and then you know making it more um, more suitable for GPUs. So um, the code on the top is what we have written, and on the bottom, what I, I will have is just um, um, GPU-based implementation of that. So the first step is to declare an array on the GPU. And I'm just gonna copy this one here, but this is not an array on the GPU just because I said it so. The way to declare an array on the GPU, well, there are multiple ways of doing that. And one um, easiest way of that easiest way of doing that, and which is something relatively new in Chapel actually, is through remote variable declarations. So I'm gonna type the code for that and then explain what's going on here. So this here is a remote variable declaration syntax in Chapel, and it's based on this concept of on. So we will see on statements a lot in this demo today. And what on statement does is it will just move execution and allocation to a different locale. And locale is a concept of locality in Chapel that I'm hoping that will um, uh, it will be more more concrete as we go along. So what it will do is just it will move the variable declaration onto onto this locale. And what is this locale? So here in Chapel is a predefined word for you, and it's uh, it it identifies the current node that you're running on. So 
if you are just using a single workstation, then it will be always the same thing. But if you are using a multi-node setup, you can just uh, like uh, use here to understand which node exactly you are running on. So a key concept in GPU support in Chapel is this GPUs array on top of here. So GPUs is just another array that stores what we call sublocales. So here, what's happening here is I'm seeing here a lot. I realize. Um, so what's happening in this line is we are accessing the GPUs array that represents the devices that I have on this current node that I'm executing, and I'm just picking the first one out of it. It's a zero-based array, so GPU zero will just give me device zero. So what's happening here is just I'm declaring an array that is similar to what I did before, but this time this is on the first device. So it will be just using uh, uh, GPU memory. Let's start with that. So writing it out is just simple write ln again. And what we will learn um, as we go along is this write ln actually will be exec executed by the CPU. So here the array memory is actually using device memory, but when you're writing it out, the CPU will actually read the device memory one by one and it will print it out. So it just works just fine, but there will be a bunch of communication between GPU and CPU when you when you do this. But the compiler and the runtime system is ready to handle that. So let's try to increment the elements by one and print it out. And the way that we did that before, I'm just going to pick this one, is true for all statements. And let's write it again. So. Still, this for all loop has no signal that it should execute on the GPU. It will still execute on the CPU, and it will be inefficient in that sense, but CPU can read the GPU memory one by one, and this is handled by compiler and the runtime for you. So if you want to inspect just one element of a GPU array or something like that, you can certainly do that without adding any extra call for communication between CPU and GPU. It's all handled for you. So how then how can we move this execution to the GPU? Well, we already have this hint from the on statement in the first line that we had, right? And in that, I mentioned that there is this concept of an on statement um, in Chapel where you can use to move, where you can use an on statement to move an execution and allocation to a different locale. So here I will do the same thing. And this time I will have a full blown on statement like this. And within it, I'm just gonna put the same code that I have here. And I can actually keep the right LM on the outside of the own statement. Now let's see what's going on here. So what will happen here is that this on statement or the body of the on statement will be executed notionally on the, on the GPU. And that notionally means if the compiler finds something that can execute on GPU's processors, it will just use GPU's processor. If it finds any dynamic memory allocation, it will put the memory allocation on the GPU's memory. Going back to the first thing that I said, anything suitable for GPU execution, that typically that, that is typically defined by order independence in Chapel. And that's a concept, but you know, it, it's not it's not all too complicated. All parallel for loop flavors will just execute on the GPU. So for all is the one that I'm using in today's demo. It's the most common data parallel loop in Chapel, and for all loops are um, GPU eligible by default. Another loop that I will not be using today is for each. Um, and for today's purposes, I think for each and for all are interchangeable, but for all are just more common. So I'm just sticking with for all uh, for today. And as you can see, we get the output of all tools um, that executed on the GPU. So, so far I've been saying things like this executes on the CPU, this executes on the GPU. You just have to take my word for it. Well, you don't really have to. Um, and the next step for that is uh, uh, for that the next step what we uh, for understanding whether something is executing on the CPU or GPU our next step will be using this GPU diagnostics module and that will be the last step here. So because Chapel makes CPU and GPU execution rather seamless because we have the same loop that is executing on the CPU and same loop executing on the GPU we have additional tools for you to inspect whether um, whether something is on the CPU or GPU, or uh, there is any communication between CPUs and GPUs. And these tools are typically provided by the GPU diagnostics module. So 
let's see uh, how we can demonstrate that. Let's let's put a very general call here to start verbose GPU operations. And let me stop verbose GPU operations at the very end. So what will happen is everything that we are doing on the GPU or every interaction that we have between CPU and GPU will be just reported on the console. So the output might be a little large uh, and I can just, you know, close the scope of this start and stop uh, verbose GPUs to understand things a little bit better. But let's start with the bigger stop scope and see all the output. OK, so as I mentioned, this is a big output and mostly this is right lens. Uh, let me zoom in on the screen to just scroll through um, some of the output and I will again uh, tighten the scope to make this uh, a little easier to consume. So you are seeing things like kernel launches, copies from device to host. You can see the size of the copy and which line the kernel launches are coming from. And this is partly my fault. You are seeing some internal module code, but I'm using a developer environment and um, I'm sorry about that. Um, likely you will not see these unless you set uh, your environment to use um, developer settings and bunch of uh, lines generating another other communication calls and things like that, another kernel launch and so on and so forth. So let's focus on parts of this code so that we can see what's going on a little bit better. I mostly want to avoid write elements because they are element-wise reads from uh, CPU to GPU, so they are a little bit heavy. Um, and in fact, what I can do is just drop some of the write elements and focus on this part only. So here, start and stop verbose GPU only covers this part. And what's important on this part is there are two identical for all loops. One is outside of an on statement, this one. And this one is inside of an on statement. And the reason that I'm uh, just focusing on this part is to show you that the same loop on line 11 will be exec executing on the CPU. Namely, it won't generate any output from verbose GPU, but this one will generate an output from the GPU and that will be a kernel launch output. It compiled, let's run it, whoops. I made a mistake somewhere. Uh, did I? Oh, no, I did not. Okay, let's see. Okay, now it's zoomed in uh, to the full screen and let me show you what's going on here. So these lines are all coming from um, line 12. Let's go back to our code. And this is line 12. So what's happening here is, and going back to the output again, sorry, going back and forth. These lines are all copies from device to host and host to device. There are no kernel launches here. So what happened here is this loop, as I said, ran on the CPU, thus no kernel launch from uh, line 11. And this incrementation is handled through communication between CPU and GPU under the hood. So this could be powerful, this could be dangerous, right? Like you can use for all loops, thinking that it's running fine, it's generating a correct result, but it might be actually running on the, on the CPU. Uh, but at the same time, maybe you do want to run it on the CPU, so you have that option and GPU diagnostics allow you to uh, diagnose things like that. And in contrast, if you look at the last line in the output again, and I'm going to zoom in again, it's just a single line of output from line 18, and that's a kernel launch. And line 18 is this for all, and it turned to a kernel launch. And as you can see, there's no communication generated from this because this was like a fully native GPU execution where R is a GPU array because of this line, and this incrementation is done via GPU cores for you. That is all I got for GPU basics. Any questions at this point? There was a question um, in chat about for all versus for each, but I answered it in chat. So I think you can keep going. All right. <clears throat> That's great. All right. So that was our GPU basics. Let me go back to outline and see what we have uh, in store for us. All right. So the next step will be using locales as first class students, and this will allow us to demonstrate some GPU versus CPU portability. Let me open the outline for that one. Oops, sorry. So this will be the exact same thing actually, but this time we will use config variables to choose between GPU and CPU dynamically, and we will then declare an array on the target locale, write it out, and increment elements one by one and um, increment elements by one 
on the target locale this time. So this is the same structure as before. So what I will do is just I will copy paste from before and then um, and then we will change it as we go along. So I'll just stick with GPU diagnostics as well. Oops. And then I will declare the array. So this was part 2B, but this will be a to-do. And then um, let's write it out as well. Why not? And then one by one increments, sort of without any on statement, and then with an on statement. But this time the on statement will be using the, the target locale, right? So that's what I said, um, because this is just strictly using a GPU and it's not really very, very portable between CPU and GPU. And the purpose of this step is just to make this portable. So this will be also another to do. All right, so the, the concept that I will use on this step is config variables. And config variables are a really powerful concept in Chapel, maybe one of my favorite, and it's all it's probably everyone's all-time favorite. It's a very general concept. It has nothing to do with GPU programming, but I think it's very important that we cover that because it fits in nicely with CPU and GPU portability here. <laughs> Excuse me. So let's start um, without config variables first. And uh, let me introduce you to locale variables as first class citizens. So what I mentioned here is here is a locale type that, that identifies the current node that you're running on and that GPU zero is just a sub locale. And these are just regular chapel variables. So in chapel, there is literally a locale type, as you can see, my syntax highlighter picked it up. And you can have things like var my locale is a locale, and then you can set my locale to here, for example. And then you can even print out my locale. Let's even do that and um, show you the result live. So this is a powerful concept we can, because you can manipulate uh, locale variables or you can just pick and choose between them using just standard conditionals and things like that. And that's how things will mesh uh, with, with config variables. So you can see the line locale one, that's actually the, the right line on line seven. And locale zero is the sort of like the root locale, if you will, or the, or the root node. So here we always used here.gpus, here and here. So technically I can set my locale to be here.gpu zero. Oops. So now instead of here, I'm just setting it to a GPU um, sub locale as we call it, but it, it's still the same locale type. So the concept sub locale is not a a chapel programming concept, but more like a high level uh, conceptual thing. So what will be powerful with that is this still executes the same way as we, as we have done before. Um, I didn't put the verbose GPU output, but it's executing the same way as before. Um, if we change these to my locales. So now I can have the same thing with my locales. Let me put these back in. Let me put this to stop here, and then let me write out the array here to make it similar to the one before. So right now what I have here is instead of hard coding things to here that GPUs all around, uh, not my locales, just my locale. Um, instead of hard coding or just sprinkling my code with here that GPUs, I now just put here that GPUs into my locale and just keep using it all throughout my code. So this way, this kind of paves the way of more programmability, right? Like in a real application, you will typically have a bunch of these on, on uh, variables and on statements. So you just want to control them all. And now there is a single place where you can change uh, your, your target locale, if you will. And if you remember from our previous run, this is similar to, the, uh, to what we had before bunch of communications and no kernel launch from that first for all and a kernel launch and no communication from that second for all. So we have the same uh, same application functionally. So now we have things more uh, programmable, but we don't really have a control over it as the user of the application, right? It's still hard coded in the code. So the way that we can uh, use that is through config variables. And let me let me have um, sort of a gentle introduction for that as well. 
let me define a const and I can do something like this um, and set this to true. So now the, the use GPU constant will determine whether I want to use a GPU or not. And let's see that at play here. So here is how I set my, uh, my locale. And instead of setting it to like hard coded here that GPUs, what I can do is just, I can use a conditional expression, sort of like a question column in C, um, but in my opinion, more, um, uh, more intuitive is an if expression in chapel. And I can say things like if use GPU, then here that GPUs else here. So what happens here is if the use GPU flag is set, then I'm going to use here that GPUs. If it's unset, then I'm just going to use here as my locale. So let's compile and run this. And while doing so, I will actually uh, shorten my code as well. You don't have to have a variable definition and then set it later on. I, it was just for, demo for demonstration purposes. So I'm just going to have this, which is the same thing. So now everything is running the same as before, a bunch of communications and a single kernel launch and all tools at the end. So now my locale is just tied to use GPU and I can change this to false, recompile. And now we will see no kernel launch and just bunch of communication because the second uh, part of this code where I just do an on statement to my locale will be just uh, an on statement to here, which is practically no up, right? Like you're not moving anywhere else than you already were. So it will be identical loops um, across the board, both the first one and the second one. Um, my verbal GPU did not, oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I made a mistake in, in, in what I was saying uh, because it's not all communication because I'm using my locale for my variable declaration as well. So now variable R is not even a GPU array. So that's why my code is now more, more maintainable thanks to my locale, right? So R now is not a GPU array, neither this loop and neither is this loop. So everything is executing on the GPU because I set const uh, use GPU to false. So now the same code is executing both on the CPU and GPU, but now I have this const that I cannot really change uh, without compiling my code. Well, it doesn't have to be the case. And that's where the config variable uh, come in play. And the change for that is rather simple and intuitive. And I'll just add config to in front of this variable. No other change, I'll just compile it. And we'll see the, uh, we'll see, we'll see it in, in works um, in a minute. So what config uh, keyword does is if you put it on a module scope variable as we did here, it will turn it into a common line argument. So what happens here is since this is a const, it could also be a var. Now this is a command line argument for the executable that is generated and it's baked in. So let's run the application again. In fact, let me clear the screen a little bit. So I ran the application again, no change because the use GP is false. But now thanks to this config keyword, just one word, I actually have this flag. So I can set this flag to false, which is again, no op because the default is false, but now I can also set it to true. And now we have our familiar output of bunch of communication and just a kernel launch. I didn't have to recompile the code. I didn't have to rewire any like argument parsing logic or anything like that. I have just a very intuitive flag that is dash dash use GPU. That's the same na name as my variable. And I can just change the behavior of this application entirely through the command line, choosing between CPU and GPU. And that is all I got for this step. Any questions or comments? That is really cool, Ingen. Very cool. Um, so there are a couple of questions in here. Um, and I'll let you decide how you want to organize it. So um, Hui was asking about uh, Reduce, if you have time mm -hmm. to talk about Reduce. Um, CR actually has a specific example where something's running not quite the way they expected and has some code in the chat. Um, so, um, but indicated that we could cover, you, you could cover it at the very end, like after you're done with the rest of the, the demo. Okay. Um, and if that's okay, I'll take that offer and I'm happy to stay on uh, more than the scheduled time and go through the specific code with UCR if that's okay. And you indicated that that's okay. Um, just let us know if it's otherwise. Uh, for question one, 
and that's about reductions. I have an example where I will cover reductions and that's actually the next step. So uh, let me go through that step first. Maybe I will answer your question already. And if the question still lingers, then you know we can chat after. I'm seeing a thumbs up. Any other questions before I move on? I think you're good. All right, let's go back to the outline. And the next step, uh, as I mentioned, has some reductions in it and use of math functions. And this will be a little different than what I have because I am now getting into, you know, more realistic applications realm where we'll do some, um, you know, I don't want to make it a big deal, but, you know, more real um, operations than just incrementing an array by one. And let's see the outline for that task, um, which is somewhat similar, somewhat different, and we'll build out on top of things that we've covered already, but um, I'll write the code from scratch, hopefully. All right, so this one also, I want to make it uh, choose between CPU and GPU dynamically because it's really easy to do. So what I will do is just, I will copy these two lines from the previous example and have the same logic here as we covered. So now uh, what we'll have here is an, an on statement and I will type a bunch of code inside the on statement and discuss the impact. All right, and let's get to it. So let's write the on statement as before. And now I will put all my code inside the on statement. I stated something before that on statement moves the execution and memory allocation um, to a GPU notionally. And that is to say that only some of the things that are GPU eligible will execute on the GPU, while some other code will still execute on the CPU. Uh, and dynamic allocations, meaning arrays, or the data for the arrays rather, and class instances will be GPU accessible. So let's demonstrate that. And now inside this on statement, I can declare an array and write it out again. And this time around, I'll do something interesting because what I will do is just, I will compute an hyperbolic tangent of, um, of my values. And I want this to be kind of a symmetric array in the, in the, in the X, in the X axis, if you will. So I will have this data to have a strange domain this time something like this, and I will use a real type. So let me go slow here. So in the very first step, I discussed that my array was 1.10. In fact, let me go back to that stage where my array was 1.10 uh, in, in its domain. So the indices of the array will start from one to 10. But this time around, because I want that symmetry in the x-axis, which I will represent by arrays indices, now I will start my array from minus n to positive, uh, uh, to, to plus n. So this will have an array whose indices can be like minus 10 or something, but that would make more sense uh, mathematically if you think about it. And um, I want this array to have values between, um, values between one to 10. So in effect, what I want is, um, I want a range from minus n to n, and then I want to divide every element by, when, by n in it. So if I have n equals 100, the array will be from minus 100 to plus 100, and then elements in it will be from minus 1 to, to uh, plus 1 uh, each. So what I have here is an array declaration while also initializing the array uh, using a sort of like a promoted expression um, where I'm just computing and doing some math. And let me write out data. Let me compile it. Oops, what did I mess up? Oh, no n, of course. So I need to define my n. I'm going to put it here. And just because it's easy, I'm going to make this a config const so that I can change the array size dynamically without having to compile the code. Let's see the output. And as I mentioned, I will compute the hyperbolic tangent of this uh, of this array. And um, while doing so, I will also compute the integral of the generated curve, where I define integral as just some of the um, absolute values of the generated data. Let's run it. 
uh, it's not minus one to one. It's because I have in in integer arithmetic here. So all my n's here are integers. And if you're a C programmer, you would know that like three divided by two in C is just one, not 1.5. And it's the same in chapel. So I just need to do some casting here. Um, so that now this is a real arithmetic using floating point uh, numbers. So hopefully this will be a more um, a range that is kind of in a way that I expected, and it will range from minus one to one, and it will be uh, uniformly distributed range, I think. All right, now that's much better. Let me zoom in so that you can see the symmetry. It's from minus one to one with step uh, point one. Going back to my code, now I want to compute the hyperbolic tangent of, of this array, and I want to do it in an in-place way, um, meaning I will just change the data directly. It doesn't have to be. I can just declare another array and put the values in there. In fact, let me do it that way. Let's call this in data, and I want an out data. I don't want to initialize it anyways. I'll just keep it the default. Right now I have two data, um, two data arrays. And now let's let's cover something that was a, a question that was asked. I believe it was, uh, I believe I believe Michelle asked that. So what I will do is just, I will benefit from the fact that they are, they have the same domain. And I will do something like for all index in, in data.domain. Out data IDX equals in data IDX. And this will be just an assignment, but what I said I will do is just hyperbolic tangent. So let's just do hyperbolic tangent. And this tan h is coming from the math module. So I'll just have to use math module so that it's available to me. And then I can write a then out data. Let's see how this code works and hopefully improve it and compute the integral as well is the next step. So an interesting point here is that, um, and I believe that's related to a question that I believe Oliver asked. So as you can see now, this is a um, hyperbolic tangent function. As you might imagine, it starts negatively, it hits zero at origin, and then it's kind of symmetric on the other side of the origin, um, meaning negative and positive values are the same uh, in absolute terms. And the next step here is actually um, something to address what um, Oliver asked before. And like right now what I have is uh, a code that doesn't have perfect maintainability in my view, and that's because these two currently have the same domains, but that doesn't have to be the case. Like I can make this zero dot dot two times n minus one or something. And I, I might still want that to work. So I want to lock in the current behavior and the way to do that is just, I will declare, actually I can declare it as a const. I will declare a domain um, and I will make it minus n to n and then I can use domain across the board. So now I have hard coded the fact that in data and out data will be the same, uh, will have the same domain. And in fact, I can change this to DOM as well. So now indices will be yielded from DOM and then, um, then the code will be hopefully more maintainable. The result will be the same of, of course, uh, but I think this is a slightly better code. If you do want, um, if you do want that uh, ability to have different index sets, what you can also do, and it can in fact make make the code even more maintainable, is to is to zipper two arrays at the same time. So zip is a concept that might be familiar to familiar to you if you use Python. It's not a concept from C, uh, and zip allows you to iterate over two things in a lockstep fashion. So let's let's see that in practice. So what I want this time is in fact, let me just start a new for all while keeping it in comments. I want to iterate over um, output and input data in a zippered fashion and generate elements or yield elements from each one of them. 
So this time around, I'm just dipping out data and in data, meaning one element from each of them will be yielded at each iteration and they will be assigned to O and I. So now I can use O here and I here. Um, and compare and contrast this with the for loop uh, above. So as you can see, it's a little bit more code, obviously, but this is even more maintainable. So now, even though they are this, they have the same domain, it doesn't have to be. Like I can change my out data to have a different domain and this will still work. They don't have to be uh, perfectly aligned for this to work. And I'm gonna stick with this implementation. So now I am computing the uh, hyperbolic tangent and putting it into out data. But what I also had promised is to compute the integral of the curve. And integral here is just the sum of absolute values of everything that I computed. So I see a question and I can answer it right now. Yeah, this is a related question what you're talking about here. Um, so we asked in the chat if you have to have the for all loop or if you can just do essentially an array assignment. Um, I indicated you probably could, but I don't know if you'll get the parallelism that the for all loop is getting. And I also have a question of, I think you can do it as long as both arrays are the same size, but do they also have to be the same domain? That's, a, that's as a follow up to the promotion question, right? Whether it can be an array assignment. Correct. And yes, that's the answer, follow up is from me. Mm -hmm. Okay. The answer to both questions is yes. And these are really good questions. I kind of thought about going there, but I didn't. I'm glad you asked. So you don't even have to write this for a loop, <laughs> is the bottom line. And you can literally have out data equals ton h in data. And this is, let me comment it more properly. And this will have the same behavior as the for loop above. And let me explain why. Um, so Chapel compiler is able to do something that we call promotion. And promotion means a function that takes a scalar. So here 10h takes a scalar, meaning a single value, can be used in array context. So instead of using a single real, you can use an array of reals. And the compiler will turn this line into this line um, almost exactly. So we are seeing the same behavior. And what's implied here is, um, implied by the same behavior is, first of all, this is a kernel launch, and I can confirm that in a GPU, with GPU diagnostics in a second. This will be a kernel launch, just like a for all loop. And in terms of Michelle's question, it doesn't have to be the same domain, it just have to be the same size. And compiler will generate the for all loop and just for all loop semantics apply for promotions like this. I hope that answered the question. I think so. Thank you. All right. And at this point, I'm just going to put GPU diagnostics to make sure that we are actually uh, executing a kernel. Because I wrote a lot of code, I'll just stick them here so that I don't see a wall of text um, coming from verbal GPU, just to make sure that this is actually a kernel launch. Because it's a live demo. Everything could go wrong. Maybe it's not a kernel launch. It will be scary and appropriate for Halloween. So let's wait for it to finish. Um, there is an advantage of using a for all loop, and that will be uh, my next step here. Yep, exactly. There is no kernel launch here. Okay, that's something that I need to figure out, obviously. Let's see if I made a mistake here. Oh, no. Wait. My use GPU is false. So I compile this code. By default, I'm not using any GPU, but without recompiling, I can actually throw in use GP equals true. And now it's a kernel launch. Phew, that was a close call. And yeah, again, sorry about this um, internal outline, uh, output of the line. Um, it's just my settings. I believe I might be able to revert it. Um, let me recompile it just so that you know, we can see it um, more. Let me disable the same environment variable and see if this will be enough to make it a user line. But in any case, the bottom line is this was actually a kernel launch or was able to run on a GPU kernel, but I was just using use GPU 
the default value of use GPU, which was false. So that's why we were getting uh, no kernel launch, but just setting the flag to true without recompiling, uh, we were able to get the kernel launch. And again, by default, I'm not getting any kernel launch, but if I run the same application with use GPU true, I am getting kernel launch and thankfully that environment variable fixed it. This is coming from line 25, which is exactly this line. Um, so with that, I'm going to make the same mistake again. And before I make that same mistake again, I'm just going to change the default to true um, and we'll stick with that. All right, so um, <clears throat> we computed the um, hyperbolic tangent of uh, this data and put it in an out data. So the next thing that we want to do was um, integral of the curve. And in fact, let's build on top of this code without going back to um, going back to the for all and um, see if we can see if we can compute the integral of out data where again it may not be the perfect definition of integral it's just an absolute or sum of absolute values values of out data and what i can do is i'm just going to define a variable sum and i will store store the result in it and i will make the sum equal to some reduction of absolute values of everything in out data Simple as that. So let's see what's going on here. So ABS is the, another function similar to 10H and it's an absolute value function. It's coming from the math module. It's again a scalar function. It's supposed to take a single integer or real or whatever, but now I'm passing an array of it. If I pass an array of it, it can turn into a for all loop under the hood by the compiler automatically. And what happens here is I'm using a reduce expression Reduce expressions are again first class citizens in chapel. There's nothing specific to them um, um, about GPUs. If you execute a reduce expression on a GPU, it might execute. Um, sorry, if you're executing a reduce expression on a GPU sublocal, it will execute on on GPU processors. This is identical rule as for all, because reduce expressions are actually for alls under the hood. But if you're executing a reduce expression that is GPU eligible, it will execute as a kernel. And the way to see that is again, the GPU diagnostics outputs. Now I have another um, uh, kernel launch coming from line 26, which is exactly this line. So this turned into a GPU kernel in which output data's absolute values are sum reduced. I realize that I haven't printed out some, but I can uh, just using write -alert. And in fact, I can do, I, I cancel the compilation. Uh, if I just want to print it out as like a output, I can do even this. And the compiler will figure it out. It will still be a kernel and the output will be uh, a single write -alert, uh call, hopefully. So this is really cool, uh, Ingen. You've only got three minutes to the top of the hour. This will be my so last I... step. Okay. I'm almost done. Oops. And now we are getting two launches again. Where did my right line go? Oh, okay, this is my right line. And that will be the sum of uh, the output. One thing that I wanted to go back to, uh, and that will be the last step, is just for alls. So the tricky part with this is now I have two kernel launches, one to compute the 10H um, of element-wise uh, data, and then compute the absolute value of these. And two kernel launches is okay, but if you can do it in a single uh, kernel launch, that would be even better in terms of performance because you're already on the GPU, you executed the uh, function, you have the data already, why don't you just sum it uh, right there? So let me go back to my for all base approach. And now put these in comments. So this is what I had before. So what if I had my sum here, that's a real, and I want to just sum the O that I already computed here and put it on top of sum. I could do something like this, but then this for all is a parallel loop. And in parallel, I'm trying to increment something that is shared. So this is a definition of a race condition. And I'm hoping that even compiler will not allow me to do this. Uh, and let me let me confirm that suspicion. Because it's the potential race condition. Um, I had a Teams window there, but it says, uh, let me zoom in. It says cannot assign to const variable in line 23. And it says the shadow variable sum is constant due to task intents. So 
Without going into the details, line 23 is a problem because it thinks sum is a const and it will be a const inside for all because compiler protects you from that race condition. But what I really want to do is actually, I want to sum reduce the output, right? And the way to do that in chapel is using with clauses. So I can do with sum reduce sum. Now I'm telling the compiler that I really want to use the variable sum for sum reduction or plus reduce, uh, just to reduce redundancy in what I say. And uh, let me write out sum as well. So this time around, compiler will not complain, hopefully, unless I made an another mistake. Um, and it will sum reduce sum. So all of these reductions are handled by um, CUDA libraries and HIP libraries, if you're familiar with them, CUB and HIP CUB. So we don't implement the logic, what we just use those libraries for better performance, but under the hood, it's all handled by the compiler and the runtime for you. So as you can see, um, this is again, um, a single kernel launch. I got the sum this time. Well, I, did, I forgot the absolute value thing, but you know, um, it's the same idea. So as you can see, it's near zero, something really tiny because this is a symmetric function, uh, the 10H function. Um, but if you do abs there, this will be a scalar call to abs and sum will be a sum reduction of the values that we generate. And that's the last thing I got. Well, I had one more thing, but we didn't have the time for it, but that's okay. That will be for, for the next demo. And thanks everyone for um, coming and watching and we are at time, but I'm more than happy to stick around and answer questions. I know there was one that I promised that I can help offline. So this will be a good time for that. And maybe we can yeah, end the I'm recording here. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. All right.